Okay, I'd like to call the meeting to order. The time now is 11.05, right? Yeah. Or 11.04. 11.06. Okay, great. Uh, <laughs> we're going to take amended, uh, take attendance and approve the minutes, and what I'll do is start with those on the phone, and it might be easiest if I uh, call out the names of those who have RSVP'd that will be on the phone, and then you can let us know who you are on, and you can hear us properly. Barbara Lee Diamondstein Spielbogel. Barbara Lee? I, I can hear Great. you. Great. We can hear you too. Good. <laughs> Senator Betty Little? Senator Betty Little? Okay, Dan Fuller? Dan Fuller? Okay. Peter Carafano? Spike Herzig? I'm here. Okay, Spike, great. Thurman, Thomas? Okay. We will give them a chance if they are. Uh... Sounds like somebody just joined us. No? Okay, and then I'd like to go around the room, um, starting to my right. Uh, Irene Baker, be... Madison Square Garden. Melanie Klausner, Finn Partners. Mark Wilson, I love New York, International Marketing. Maura Silver, Finn Partners. John Ernst. Eleanor Tatum, Amsterdam News. Catherine Nichols, Niche Media. Javen Clemente, I Love New York. Lisa Soto, I Love New York. Gavin Landry, I Love New York. Lizette Montero, I Also Love New York. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Rowena Sahuli, I Love New York. Ross Levi, I Love New York. Okay, and then Rob, we'll start with you. Rob Mitchell, JetBlue. Good morning, Natasha Caputo, Westchester County. Institute of History, Archaeology, and Education. Hello. 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 Hi, Bethany okay. Little online. Welcome, Senator. Anybody else join us on the phone? You. Yeah, Tom Regan from ESD Council. I'm also on the phone. We have Ken Wong, who is being very humble and operating. Everyone should have received a copy of the minutes via email, and Lisa has extra copies if you need them. Uh, are there any changes to the minutes? I'm going to ask for a motion to approve the minutes. So moved. Second. Second. Okay, well, okay. thank you. The motion carries. Minutes are approved. Eleanor and John. John and Eleanor. So, welcome back. I hope everyone had a, a very nice summer. I know that uh, the tourism in New York State is just continuing to grow. I'm reading so many wonderful stories, and we're going to hear more about that from Gavin. Um, and because fall is such an important time for agritourism in New York State, he's also going to update on all of Taste New York's activities. Oh, should we have uh, Kevin King do it? Who's Kevin? He'll be here. It, he's coming. Okay, great. Kevin King's coming. Uh, I have a couple of housekeeping items. First of all, our good friend, Irene Baker, who also heads up the task force for sports and entertainment. Her term expired, but that doesn't mean that we're letting her go. <laughs> <laughs> So Irene has uh, graciously agreed to continue working with us on the task force, mm -hmm. um, and we'll go a little bit more about that later in the meeting. So thank you, Irene. And now we have a new member of TAC, uh, Catherine Nichols. Uh, Catherine's the chief executive officer of um, Niche Media, the country's preeminent regional magazine group catering to the luxury market, and she has more than 25 years of experience in marketing, sales, and operations for the global luxury band brands and was recently honored as the corporate visionary and top woman in media by Folio uh, for her innovative approaches and accomplishments. Catherine spent over 20 years in the luxury wine and spirits business working for such industry leaders as Diageo, uh, Shifflin and Somerset, and Charmer Sunbelt Group, and Corby, Hiram Walker of Canada. And that's going to be very helpful when, we, when we're talking about taste as well. So, Catherine, we're very happy to have you join us. Would you like to say a few words? 
just how excited I am to be here. Um, I've been living in New York close to 20 years. Um, I am, a, I guess, a, a candidate for citizenship. I've done all of my um, biometrics exams and whatnot, and uh, I just am a passionate New Yorker. I love being here. I drive home to Canada, so I love the entire state, and excited to make a contribution and to join all of you. Thank you. Well, thank you, and please feel free to call any of us if you have any questions. We'd love to uh, get you started on some of these committees. Great, thank you. Um, so speaking of the subcommittees, we um, they were very busy uh, going around the state. We saw many of you at some of the events, uh, but the actual work was sort of put on hold in the summer, but we were going to be starting that up again um, shortly. But I did want to bring um, up to bring you up to speed on some of the uh, happenings in the Sports and Entertainment Committee that took place in May, right around the time of our last meeting. So we didn't have time to report on it. Irene was the chair of or is the chair of that task force. So Irene, can you? Share with us what happened at that meeting, please. Sure. So um, we brought together a number of the heads of the sports commissions that operate basically region-wide. Um, we hosted at Madison Square Garden. Thurman was kind enough to um, to host, to chair, and to uh, to host that meeting. Um, it was followed by four. We had a great working meeting. Um, basically, these commissions have been operating independently to bring sporting events to their regions and they are looking to have a stronger cohesive presence as a state um, at trade shows basically on the sports side so they want to form a statewide alliance and they're looking for guidance from the task force from our um, the tourism advisory council so I'm going to walk you through some of the um, the slides that they brought to us. I think it's important, though, at first to just kind of thematically. I think there were a number of assets that um, all of them agreed that they shared. Um, one, obviously, the New York brand. Um, we are a major sports market. I mean, not just in New York City, but also in Syracuse, in Buffalo. It's a it's a burgeoning market. Um, and then the history of sports in New York. So I think that all of that's an important piece. Colleges and universities was a big plus. Um, there are some downside and some challenges with that, but then you've also got venues. Some areas better than others, but our venues are clearly um, an asset, obviously coming from the world's most famous arena, that's easy for me to say. Um, and then in terms of obstacles, there were some themes that, that emerged. One is financial, I would just put them in three categories, financial, coordination, and then identity competition issues. So one on the financial side, there's very high bid fees, and a lot of the commissions um, have a hard time coming up with these bid fees that are necessary to really bid for the big um, events. There's a lack of funding for long-term planning for a lot of these commissions moving forward. Um, and then venue costs, particularly at some of the universities, are very high. So those are some of the issues in terms of finance. In terms of coordination, I think some of them find it challenging to get support from the local governments. Some of the county executives, there's varying levels of engagement um, on the local government level. And then really understanding on their part what the state is doing in terms of attracting sports. Um, and then last, identity versus competition goes to their desire to start an alliance, a statewide alliance, is that you know, there is not a cohesive New York presence at these sports trade shows, and that creates an issue because a lot of other states have a much more cohesive presence at these events. So I think those are the three major obstacles that we saw, um, and we'll just walk through quickly each of them. We had eight different regions, eight plus different regions represented. Um, the first was Albany County. Um, and if we just skip to their assets and obstacles, I think there you see the theme where colleges and universities are, um, are a big um, piece of their assets. Um, it's a proven sports destination. Again, we're here as New York as a major market. Um, when you're talking about obstacles, again, you see the bid fees, um, the high cost of the university facilities, um, and then having some obstacles dealing with the various localities. Um, venues, they have major venues, obviously the Times Union Center where the Devils um, AHL team plays, Siena College, University of Albany, Hudson Valley Community College. Um, they are very central in terms of the state, so they, um, they benefit from location, um, as does Syracuse um, and I think Buffalo more so, um, or growing for Buffalo. Then you go to talking about Buffalo, perfect. 
um, you know, they are they're a growing hotspot. I think we hear that a lot. You hear about Buffalo as a growing region, um, and I think you see there again the market at play and their assets and their obstacles less so on the venue side. They do, they are not as um, they don't have as a re robust venue availability. And then again, funding keeps popping up as an issue. Um, venues there are New T Northtown Center at Amherst, Harbor Center, the University of Buffalo, Riverworks. I mean, there's a number of them there, but again, not the um, <coughs> not the inventory that some of the other have. You get to Binghamton. I think again, you have here the history um, of it as a major sports market. Um, I think again, in terms of obstacles, you see long-term planning, bid fees, funding always an issue. Um, they have a number of, um, of venues there as well. Again, you see the universities at Binghamton University, the Broom Tioga Sports Complex, the Edge Indoor Sports Complex. They have a number of golf courses. Um, so you see a number of things there. Um, Long Island Sports Commission. Um, again, we all know Long Island for a lot of its golf courses. So they have the U.S. Open Golf Championships in 2002, 2004, 2009. Um, I think it's proximity to New York City. Again, location is important. Market is important. Um, and again, you see the obstacles are the same. Funding, bid fees, communication with county executives there seems to be an issue. High cost at coll college and universities. And then unlike Manhattan, they don't have a convention center. Um, and obviously, there's so many assets in Long Island, State County Parks, the Nassau County Aquatic Center. We have um, Nassau Coliseum, which is now being newly renovated, the Mitchell Athletic Complex. So they've got a, a real inventory of venues um, that are an asset. Going back west, um, you've got the Monroe County Sports Commission. Um, again, they, I don't have their list of, um, of venues, but um, again, they are an up-and-coming market for sports and entertainment. Um, I think they've done a good job attracting a number of events, but I think there, I actually may have it. Um, I think there, there is a gap, and I think a lot of room for improvement. Um, then we move on to, oh, Well, they, on. they uh, recently posted a U.S. Open. Right. Right? I think last summer. Yeah. Gavin. PGA and we, Championship. PGA right? Championship. Yeah. Yes, that's and we, we they activated they Taste there. It's really, yeah, that was our big kickoff event for Taste. Right. So, very successful. Um, NYC and company, obviously tourism generally is so big in New York City and growing. Um, we have 14 professional sports teams here in New York City. Um, we hold 515 professional events and over a thousand collegiate events. Um, I think New York in particular um, has a very robust, obviously Christine led NYC and company for a long time and we've got a number of events, but there's always room to attract others and I think given some of the improvements to a lot of the parks in recent years, I think we should be seeing more of that. Um, and then Syracuse, obviously huge sports market, particularly for college sports. They have fantastic venues. Um, it's a great market. And again, location similar to Albany, very central. Um, and they have a number of venues, including um, Carrier Dome, Lemoyne College, obviously a lot of county parks. But yet, despite all of the assets, there are a number of obstacles. And those include, again, the financial challenges, bid fees. It's the consistent um, thing that's listed. Um, lack of understanding and appreciation of what is accomplished by state and local leaders is a big piece of it. Again, I think we see there the coordination um, and just educating decision makers about what they're doing and what they're trying to attract. Um, so I think in terms of their theme and what they're trying to do is really clearly establish um, additional mechanisms for funding. Um, we talked a little bit about the CFA process, which was part of the Regional Economic Development um, Councils. I know. There was expanded funding in the second round, and that has continued for tourism. Um, hopefully, that will continue to expand, and I think they could use some assistance in navigating that process, and that's something, obviously, I was very involved with creating them, so would be happy to, to assist with. Um, engaging SUNY was another um, idea that came up, um, just in terms of the fees for universities seem to be an issue, and I think that really presented an opportunity to communicate and really engage the universities where there is sort of a mutually beneficial relationship that could exist. Um, you know, I think a big piece of it will be trying to figure out a way to collaborate and approach um, these 
these um, trade uh, these trade expos in a more coordinated way and with a more coordinated message. I think I Love New York covers the broad tourism spectrum um, and incorporates a lot of sports, but they're looking for some additional guidance in being able to represent New York State as one of the leading destinations to host sporting events. Um, so I think there's an opportunity for us to continue working together with them. As Christine said, um, we sort of took this summer off, but I think um, Thurman and I will be looking to activate this um, as we head into a few more of these um, trade meetings that are coming up, um, particularly, it's a little late, but we have one in September, one in October, and one in November, and then I think come 2016, that should really be a focus for the, for the committee. So. Um, again, I think the CFA process, SUNY and our university network, and then trying to come up with an opportunity to, to develop a, a more cohesive alliance for sports. Uh, thank you, Irene. And I'd like to open it up for questions, but what I will say is um, this is a follow-up from the meeting. We have drafted a letter to go to Chancellor Zimfer, and that'll be signed by TAC. Thurman, Irene, asking for a meeting to see how we can better coordinate with the SUNY campuses and trying to um, host more regional and also national and possibly even international events when the universities aren't necessarily in session. So we'll keep you posted on that and happy to hear any comments or suggestions on the Sports and Entertainment Commission. Um, this is Betty Little. Can I just make, can I just make a comment? Worse. Can you hear me? Yes, of course, Betty. I just wanted to mention the North Country and the Olympic Regional Development Authority. I hope no one forgets the importance of sport to the North Country. And um, I'd be more than happy to participate on that committee if you have room. We absolutely have room. And I'm actually kind of curious why they were not at the meeting. Was it just they couldn't make it? I think it was a scheduling. Okay. Scheduling. I'll have to double check, but obviously, I think the governor sure. has made more than clear how important <laughs> the North Country is to tourism and sports, Senator. So, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. and um, I'm going to have to leave the meeting early. But um, three of the things I was going to mention is they have formed a committee to try to, but you have to get the approval of the Olympic Reach, the Olympic Committee, to even consider being considered for an Olympic bid. But they do want to keep Lake Placid in line for regional Olympics, possibly with Montreal, but considering an international host uh, be the first time, and both have had Olympics before. So that's something that's in the works. The other thing is they're working very hard on attracting the international Ironman competition, and we have a bid in for 2017. We've had Ironman for oh, a long time, uh, about 14, 15 years, uh, Adirondack Ironman, and it's just been a phenomenal tourist attraction. So we think we have a serious good bid in for that. And the third thing is, and I've talked to Gavin about it, we have a young man who made a documentary on uh, being a 46er, meaning that you have climbed the 46 peaks above uh, 2,000 feet or something in the Adirondacks. I'm not one of them, but uh, yeah, he's got a really nice documentary that Gavin said he would look at. And, uh, they're con they'd like to promote it nationally, but so they need funding along those lines. But uh, those were my three things that I did want to add to the comment on. I okay, think that's great. thank you. I'm still on Thanks, the phone, Betty. but I'm going to have to bug off about 10 of 12. Well, thanks, Betty. I do want to raise an issue, though, before you leave. So what I'd like to do is just mm -hmm. see if anyone mm -hmm. has a quick comment more about this sports and entertainment. Okay, before I hand it over to Gavin, um, I did want to bring to your attention and just um, fill you in on uh, something that is happening or may happen, hopefully it won't, that has is a little bit out of our control, but that could be the government shutdown. Um, you know, there's talks again about the federal government shutting down. So what does that mean for New York State? Uh, New York State has 22 national parks that are open for business in New York State. Um, and I, it generates, let's see, when I, when I looked at this 
It's pretty astounding. Um, 16 million visitors to our national parks in New York State and 500 million um, in economic benefit to New York State from our national park visitation. Now, some of the national parks, you will you'll see where the numbers come from. The Statue of Liberty, Ellis Island, one of them. African Burial Ground, another. Castle Clinton, of course, in Lower Manhattan. Eleanor Roosevelt House, um, Erie Canal Way, Federal Hall, Fort Stanwix, Gateway, um, General Grant's uh, tomb up in uh, northern Manhattan. Hamilton Grange, also in northern Manhattan, which is getting a lot of attention lately because of the hot play here on Broadway, Hamilton. <coughs> that play was uh, written, actually, at <coughs> Hamilton Grange. Uh, Martin Van Buren's home in Kinderhook. I'm skipping a few. Niagara <coughs> Falls, Sagamore Hill, St. Paul's Church, Saratoga, um, Theodore Roosevelt's birthplace. So you get the idea here that national parks are very big business here for New York State tourism. So in last year, when we were faced with this, uh, we we're very fortunate to have a governor who understands it. Um, as we heard, other governors were starting to meet on this. Um, governor Cuomo actually led the charge, and he went um, – he made sure that the Statue of Liberty and Ellis Island were open for business because that's one of the largest revenues, revenue generators not only for New York City but also New York State tourism. I hope we won't have to call upon the governor again, but um, what I'd like to do is after this meeting, we will notify the second floor. Just I'm sure they're already aware of it, but if any of you also have um, input to not only the governor, but your state legislators, Betty Little, um, and others yeah. that could be a prominent voice on making sure that these national parks are held exempt from, you know, the bureaucratic um, impasse that's going on in Washington. So, Betty, I wanted you well, to know about that before you hung up. Oh, absolutely. And um, two of our congressional people, Lee Stefanik and Chris Gibson, have already come out that they, they're not looking at any kind of shutdown. A shutdown is a horrible thing to have happen. Great. Well, thanks for their support and your support. And um, Gavin, I'd like to send it over to our executive director to give us an update. Gavin sure, Landry. Sure. Um, hey, good morning, everybody here and on the phone. I wanted to just uh, make note that Kevin King our partner from Magnet Markets has shown up, so we're delighted to have Kevin here uh, for his update on Taste New York. So I'll update you kind of on what's happened over the summer, but I do this on behalf of our entire team, and I'm just the lucky one that gets to actually be able to talk about it. But this this work represents, uh, you know, probably 40 or 50 people who uh, all together work on, on these initiatives. So I uh, wanted to share this with you. This is kind of a look back because we haven't met, I believe, since it was in May, last May. time. Last time it was in May, so this kind of covers the, the time period since we last met. Uh, and at the end of this, I'll just share with you one of our um, advertising pieces that's going forward in case you haven't seen it. So on the advertising front, uh, we've continued with our out-of-home uh, uh, commercials as well as the uh, all the work that we do uh, with the, the TV and the digital. These are just some examples of that. Uh, I think you'll, you'll take note that <clears throat> this is really part of the awareness campaign that we've talked about before. And based on a tracking study that we have in place, we, we know that this is starting to have an effect, a positive effect on people's perceptions and awareness of New York State assets. So we're continuing this uh, as part of our, our, <coughs> our planned efforts on a seasonal basis for the summer, fall, and winter. Something new this year is we, we looked at um, a couple of strategies relative to how can we get people more aware of events and use the New York City market as a, as a possibility for uh, for the events that are happening all around the state? And so I got to shout out Lisa here, who really, and Lizette, who coordinated with Time Out New York and, and with Strauss on uh, making sure we represented the great event assets that were taking, that were happening, activities that were happening over the summer. And then weekly, all the way from, I believe it was June through Labor Day, May, May through Labor Day, uh, every week you would find these activities represented. You have a couple of, there's the Time on New York and Strauss publications, are, uh, just examples that are on the desk. Ross is uh, doing his best banner version here, uh, showing them off. So, but uh, <laughs> feel free to, to check those out. But I, I think, again, that's just part of our strategy of, of identifying 
the New York City metro market as a, as a prime target for upstate New York. Our market in New York just closed. Uh, we had um, 200 and 202 finalized applications for the $12 million. Uh, there's a bright line this year with $5 million for marketing and $7 million for, for capital. And um, you know, th that just tells you that this is a highly competitive process. I mean, 202 projects that are applying for $12 million bucks is uh, highly competitive. And this, again, comes from the regional councils that uh, Irene was so deeply involved with. And uh, really, it's a grounds up, kind of bottoms up approach to identifying valuable projects that make sense. And then, then we, as a state, support those things that are, that are identified by the regions. Something else that we've done this year that's new is um, we've actually gone, uh, Rich Newman and I have gone to <coughs> the regions themselves and have had meetings with all of the TPAs. The regions that are on the, this, uh, this deck are the ones that we've met with so far. We actually have a, another meeting this Friday with Capsera covering off, I think we've gotten uh, to roughly 45 or so of the 62 counties in New York State so far. And the idea is that we wanted to go and actually talk to the TPAs and say, look, here's our strategy. Let's learn about your strategy. And then how can we align on, the, on these two strategies and, and really not do things that are either redundant or repetitive? Um, we wanted to talk with them about the customer journey and the role that the state can play in that journey. And, and basically what we're saying is that we think we can do a good job of creating awareness, consideration, and perception of New York State. But the state really needs our partners to uh, focus on the experience and the advocacy piece. And so what does that mean? It means that if the state is really focusing on the front end of the journey, then we'd like to see the regions focus on the way that the experience can be improved for the, the actual visitor. And so an example of that might be the, the motor coach wall at the Corning Museum of Glass, where at the motor coach entrance there's now a digital, there are a couple TVs, uh, with a video from around the state, and it shows a map of the state, it shows where folks are because in the past, you know, folks had gotten off their motor coach and they had been so packaged up they didn't even know where they were. And so uh, this is an example of how focusing on the actual experience is, uh, is, is, is being uh, uh, part of that journey. I'm not sure if somebody's got Yeah, a, somebody put yeah, us on hold. Somebody's got us on hold. So got us on hold. If you can unhold us, that would be great. No. Maybe not. All right, so I'll just speak through the confusion. <laughs> Very busy for international. Uh, the market at the <coughs> table can uh, certainly attest to this. But uh, as you know, we've really been focusing uh, heavily on the international market. And um, over the summer, we've had a number of major initiatives. Uh, IPW in, in Orlando, which is international, it used to be called International Powwow, but it is the major international trade show. And Ross went for the first time this year. And Ross, do you have some thoughts on that? Yeah, it was, um, it was quite an experience. Uh, and, and certainly what it emphasized for me is what we've heard again and again probably most loudly from the governor, that uh, sort of if you show it to them, they will come. That when we were talking to international operators from China and Europe, some of whom knew us very well and were already running tours, but many, many who are not yet. And when you would tell them about New York State canals, when you would tell them about uh, our wineries, when you would tell them about our historic sites, when you tell them about all the things that are here in New York that they didn't even know were here, you see them sort of light up uh, and say, oh, wow, that's amazing. Um, and so that, and that begins the relationship uh, where our international offices are able to take over more. But certainly that was probably my biggest sort of takeaway from it, uh, is the importance of being at these trade shows and the importance of continuing to talk about what our assets are. Yeah. And the Canadian Roadshow, Markley has really um, put a, a huge emphasis. Uh, now that we've had the support of the governor to to make sure we include Canada as much as we possibly can because that is incredibly important to us relative as a, as a source market. So uh, to have us already have done a, a Roadshow, we have another major initiative in Canada coming up a little later this year. Uh, those are those are uh, important initiatives. <clears throat> Under digital, you can almost consider this international as well. But um, the last year, Markley and I built a partnership with a group called Viator. Now, if you haven't heard of Viator, this is the largest seller of activities in the in the world. They, they are uh, the largest in this, this space, so to speak. And uh, recently, we were acquired by TripAdvisor. So uh, our goal with Viator was to build uh, as much product as we could that was non-New York City-based attractions uh, and have that become a product that was available for sale on Viator. We have uh, set a goal for 50 attractions, Markley, and I believe we have uh, 52, 52 attractions that are non-New York City based attractions that now have existing product that's for sale on Viator. So I would I would give you kind of a homework assignment. That is, go go to TripAdvisor, 
and pull up uh, just like George or whatever you might want to. Th in fact, you can go to the New York State page when you go into the regional section. And if you're on, on uh, TripAdvisor, where you see the Frederick Remington House here, you'll see a button that says Book Now. And you click that button, Book Now, it will take you directly to the Viator page with the product that's built out. You can check avail availability by date, and you can actually move <coughs> your booking on, on the site. The Frederick Remington Museum, uh, which probably, Peter, you know the museum, right? It's a fairly small on the St. Lawrence Seaway. It's not the easiest to get to, I suppose has sold in less than a month 145 admission tickets. So the idea was uh, if, you, if you create the product, there is demand for the product. We have to make it, uh, as part of the distribution channel, we have to make it consumable. Another major victory I suppose we had with this is that um, the state park system signed on to Viator with Niagara Falls. And so in the past, the Niagara Falls experience was, was not available to purchase from a distance. You had to walk up and get your Made in the Mist ticket, you had to walk up and get your adventure pass. This is now available on Viator, and I believe in the first month, monthly, it was uh, something like three or 400 uh, Niagara Falls Discovery Passes were sold on, on Viator. So we, we're about to get another report with an update, but uh, I think this is a just a, a really critical part of our way of connecting the, the, the marketplace to the distribution network and to the traveling public. And um, the Strom Museum, which last, last week Ross and I were there for their opening of the Toy Hall of Fame, uh, which is a major, it's a big deal. Uh, they are about to come on board with, with Viator, uh, they're signing their agreement with Viator. And when they did this, they took a lot of time and looked at it, and, and I'm taking more on this than I, than I thought I would, but uh, the benchmarking that they did, one of the places they checked out was the Spy Museum in Washington, D.C. And of the entire online visitation the Spy Museum you know, has, or purchases, uh, ticket purchases uh, for online, one third comes from by in Washington D.C. Spy Museum in Washington D.C. So yeah, we, yeah, we think this is a great. Do thing. we do we get any kind of sharing of commissions if we drive it? No, actually, um, the relationship is helpful in, in a number of ways. One, uh, Viator uh, deferred any fees to sign on with. They're typically fees for the attractions to sign on, so they waive those fees. And the relationship is really a net rate relationship, just like they would have with a school group or any other tour operator. So it's really a direct relationship between Viator and the attraction. Our goal is really to have them take the time, because Viator literally writes every every asset that's on there, and their team writes the copy. They build it, they put it on the distribution channel. So um, we get that's what we get out of the deal, which I think is a, is a, is a great thing. It, it increases the visitation to the assets and the attractions. So check it out when you have time at home uh, to just see see how that's that's how that's looking these days. Our publications you have in in the uh, folder some of our publications that we did over the summer. But one of the, the publications is an itinerary uh, kind of listing that that Lizette and her team created for our event activation. So again, just following on with the idea that folks like to be kind of given some hints and led in the direction where we want them to to, to travel. <coughs> On the segment travel side, Path Through History, we have uh, Anna and her team really did a great job kind of taking a, an external website and, and building it into the I Love New York website. It's highly uh, improved in terms of functionalities and so on and so forth. Obviously, the, the uh, search engine positioning that comes from this will be beneficial to us. But in, in, in large part, we kind of soft launch this because you like to sort of test these things and make sure that they're that they're working the way that you want uh, before you kind of really shout it to the world. But th this this is just another way of investing in path of history, the governor's vision for connecting all the cultural assets in New York State. On on that line, Rowena and uh, our friends at the Hudson Valley Greenway ran Path of History Weekend this year. This has now become a uh, something that people look forward to. They, they actually ask us, when's Path of History Weekend? And they put it on their calendar. Uh, there was a 60% increase, I think, in, in events uh, this year over, over last year. The the assets, the, the you know all the Path of History assets uh, themselves, the, the attractions, are now familiar with the process of enrollment and signing up for these things. So we feel like this is, on, on the calendar, we have this marked every year to have this as, as an occurrence. LGBT, Ross can really speak to this, but I, I believe we attended seven of these events, Ross, and then had materials at all of them, but I don't know if you had anything to add. Yes, of course, June is Pride Month, so that's a really important month for the initiative uh, to get. It's a really great and low-cost and efficient way to reach 
the LGBT community and let them know about all that's happening across New York State all year round. And so we took full advantage of that by making sure that we had a physical presence at seven prides, but you see that of the 20-something prides that happen all across New York State, uh, where we couldn't be in person, we at least sent materials, including the travel guide that's in your packet, uh, so that people could be aware. We also had some paid advertising, particularly in New York City. It's a great time to reach uh, folks actually from the whole tri-state area to some degree nationally, and actually a lot of international LGBT folks. So it's a great time for us to do our advertising to our community, and we utilize Pride to do that. Yeah, and great job on that. On the uh, segment travel piece, I mean, really, this this falls into the category of what uh, is very gratifying when you come to work and, and you know that you can leverage some of the things you're doing. And one of the things I'm going to let Marcus speak about the fishing trip, but the um, the, the Central Park activation with the fishing, we we had uh, several pro fishermen in their boats in Central Park as part of the adventure days. Uh, Ken and Lizette and the team really helped us out a lot there with the bass folks, and we had the pod there, and so everybody could really literally take a fishing rod and cast and learn how to cast and they did it at targets and they got little prizes and so on and so forth. Um, as a result of this also Bass uh, was able to leave behind 200 rods and reels that are now part of the lending program in Harlem and so we basically did this because we thought that, that this was an opportunity to bring bass fishing to folks that may not have bass fishing brought to them on, on a regular basis and we thought it was a great thing. Uh, likewise, the Eagle Academy trip, uh, as you know, we took uh, folks from Eagle Academy skiing in the winter, and we thought, well, why don't, why don't we do something in the summer? And so, Mark, do you want to tell them a little bit about the, the fishing trip? Well, we, co we collaborated with the, uh, the Department of Environmental Conservation, uh, and they enthusiastically made arrangements for a, a busload of kids from this uh, the school to go fishing in the Catskills, and it was absolutely wonderful. The management of Eagle decided that it should be a trip between fathers and sons. And it was uh, really exciting, really meaningful, not only for the kids and their parents, but also for the staff of Eagle that was there and for the DEC staff. It was a very, very positive experience for everyone involved, and I think that uh, it helped extend uh, beyond the normal markets the assets of New York State to others that we haven't really marketed to as much as we could. Yeah, and, and Markley, by the way, is an accomplished fisherman himself, but uh, <laughs> can you just remind people about Eagle Academy and who they are? Yeah, well, uh, many years ago, some research was done to identify where the majority of those people who are in prison come from, and it ended up with five zip codes being identified. Eagle Academy was created in those five zip codes for young men at risk. So Eagle Academy is a school in Harlem specifically for young men in one of those zip codes. Yeah, so particularly gratifying work. And, you know, we look forward to continuing those initiatives going forward. Our PR, uh, Melanie, is here. She's If she looks exhausted, she should. We've been doing <laughs> a lot of work on that front. PR has, uh, we, we've had tremendous success over the summer with the number of press trips in the urban media, uh, but as you can tell, it, this is a the, the big piece of the puzzle, and uh, we, I think one of the things that's really interesting about the press trips now is not so much that we're doing them because we've done them for a while, but it's who's on these press trips. So we had, uh, is it was it Merlo Mommy that was on one of the? Yeah, we took her to the Governor's Wine Cup um, and did the agricultural tour this summer. So. Right, right, and then I know we had uh, the Mommy Blogger, uh, but some, you know, influencers in spaces that are sort of non-traditional and that are still incredibly valuable to us are, are folks that are on these press trips. Uh, one of the other things we had this, this past summer was something called Travel Classics, which are the editors, grade A, you know, top-notch top, top -notch editors from within the travel vertical who literally came to New York State. They, they've been in New York State once before, but many years ago, uh, but typically they go overseas. They've been in uh, Cork, Ireland. They've been, oh my goodness, uh, Brazil. Right, so it was an incredible, it was a great, great opportunity. Natasha and company hosted us there at the uh, castle, right, the castle, which is beautiful in exactly. Terrytown. Yeah. Yeah, if you yeah. haven't been to the castle in Terrytown, <laughs> really, I'll, I'll be a walking advertisement. It is stunning, but uh, really wonderful opportunity. And as a result, we've gotten some tremendous coverage uh, from the folks that were on that trip. And, and Natasha, thank you. You, you folks did such a wonderful job uh, organizing. It was not necessarily easy at all times, but really, really great. 
the media nights uh, that we, we've been taking on, I think I talked to you before about our strategy is that we're, we're trying to go to locations that are both accessible and desirable to the media. And it's really paying off this last media night. I wasn't able to attend, but uh, by all reports and certainly by the number of media that attended, 88 media. Um, Tom and John both attended. Mm -hmm. What did you what did you guys think? That was great. Yeah. Terrific. I was great. full. You were full? Oh, good. There are a lot of places that uh, are up there that are actually nice for them to gather and, and put something together. So That's nice. great. That's great. So we're, we're excited about this uh, kind of strategy. And our next media night will be uh, we locked it down. Is it uh, Celsius? We're looking at that for yeah. today. Looking at, at Celsius, which is a location that overlooks Bryant Park and is a beautiful place to talk about, you know, about the winter. So I think we're focusing on around November fourth or, or thereabouts. Partnerships, uh, as you know, we have a partnership with JetBlue, uh, and uh, we did a few things with them over the summer. Uh, most notably, the co-branded shirts as part of the New York City Pride Parade. Likewise, we built a partnership with Delta. And you will see uh, Christine Nicholas looking very, very nice, ringing the bell in the stock exchange photo there. But uh, the Delta partnership is is one that's newly created, and we've really enjoyed uh, you know the visibility that it's gotten so far. And uh, Patty, I don't know if you wanted to just comment a little on that. Or absolutely, we're very proud of uh, rolling out the partnership this past summer, or actually two weeks ago. Officially, um, we rang the uh, closing bell, and and Ross and Christine were there, and, and Lisa and, and Lisa team were amazing. I, I know as as everyone knows, these things are not easy to put together, especially with all the different partners you have. Um, obviously, major focus on upstate markets. We have a huge rollout going on right now with Grand Central, uh, with our partners, um, the various partners that we sponsor across the state. Um, so we're very proud, and we're, we continue to uh, elevate this uh, this great partnership both internationally and and uh, throughout the state. So we're very proud to be. So, in your packet, ladies and gentlemen, this is a void ticket. <laughs> it is nonetheless a ticket. <laughs> we are super excited about this. And, I, and I'll tell you, I have to really give Rowena, who, by the way, is uh, with bearing her first child. Uh, so, uh, Rowena Zuli really worked so well with Lottery to develop a relationship. Now, it's a scratch off ticket. And it, it, you could say that's really, if someone could unhold us again, that'd be lovely. Um, the the idea with this is that I love New York as many times associated with New York City, and our strategy is to try to associate it with the entire state. So now, when you scratch off the I love New York scratch off ticket, you can trips to all 11 vacation regions, and you can win I love New York merchandise. There are a total of about 60 trips that are curated with uh, fit partners and, and the TPAs that you can win as a result of this. But the beauty of this is that Lottery is going to be doing a huge um, advertising push for the ticket. So the ticket goes in, in, in market on October 13th, start seeing television commercials, out of home, all of the, the typical lottery kind of promotional effort. But at the same time, that lottery has been working with us to say, what is your strategy? How can we how can we leverage that? How can we work together? Because they could they could literally have done it without us. But they could have not asked our opinion, so to speak, and, you know, once we said yes to the to the to the licensing of the logo. But They've been very, very good about wanting to, to know how they can work with us to, to make it good for lottery, obviously, but good for us as well. So we're excited about it, and it, and it seems like um, the, the lottery folks, uh, Rowena, I don't know if you want to comment, but the lottery folks are equally excited. Right. No, I mean, it's been a great collabor collaboration between two agencies, just um, making sure that, you know, their goals and our goals are aligned, and they've been, you know, great to work with, um, you know, just from curating the trips and, you know, providing the information we need and running approvals by us, um, you know, we're where both, both agencies were very excited about the ticket. And, you know, based on the success of one, you know, we're hoping that, you know, there's other things that we might be able to build from it. And and the vacations, they're all around the state, and, you know, um, the TPAs really, you know, um, put a lot of, um, you know, thought into, uh, you know, the experience, um, TPAs and also from partners, and the experience of what, you know, um, a winner might like to enjoy. So these are dream trips, and folks can win these dream trips to the 11 vacation regions. So we're excited about them. Excited about them. Do they have the trips listed, though, somewhere on the website so we can see what they are? Yes, mm -hmm. they, they're all listed. Um, the experiences are, are kind of curated. There's uh, an ability for folks to get a credit for transportation. They get a mm -hmm. certain amount of money for transportation, as well as um, I think each trip includes a certain amount of money while they're in 
in the so I think the value of the trips is around five thousand. Yep. So it includes taxes. So it's there's lodging, there's attractions, some dining, and then also spending money. So with that spending money, you know, it's a, um, for the user to use for transportation and anything else they like to experience in the region. So along with the package, then it's they'll also receive a travel guide of the region, and so they can you know see what else is a uh, you know they can experience and enjoy. So um, I'm getting close to the end here. I, I know I'm kind of running on a little long, but um, in terms of our summer tourism displays, Lizette and Ken and the team really do a great job with this at, at, up at the plaza. If you haven't been up there, I mean, look at this uh, kind of the Adirondack uh, display, uh, looking display with the kayaks and so on and so forth. I mean, it's really just capitalizing on that Albany market and folks that are, I, I think that there's a staggering number of people that go through the plaza on an annual basis. And I, I wouldn't know the number off the top of my head, but I, I knew it was a large number. Uh, so we have another opportunity to kind of create awareness up there. The event pod, which as you know, uh, uh, was, I'll uh, give full credit, was Lizette's idea a couple years ago and uh, is a great idea. It's a walking uh, or a mobile billboard when it's on the truck. I actually passed it one day and took a picture of it. Everybody was saying, don't do that, you're going to wreck your car. But uh, <laughs> the, the, the idea with this the pod this year is that, in fact, it's at Union Square now, isn't it? Uh, yes. It's uh, as we speak. It was just at the Balloon Festival this past weekend. The idea that's a little different this year is that there is a green screen where you can take your photo and it's in front of uh, an iconic asset of New York State. You have to guess and obviously we'll send you the photo uh, no matter what. And there's also a bucket list function so you can create your bucket list. Uh, you can kind of goof around with the screen, create your bucket list, it'll be emailed to you. Uh, as well as the trivia contest which was carried forward from last year. But the strategy really this year that, that Lizette and her team put in place was the idea that we would go to fewer events because we went to something like 50 events last year total. Um, and we would have a larger team. So there's a dedicated trained team that Lizette had programmed through the state. They did they got, <coughs> had an incredible tour uh, through the state, which was over a course of days that uh, was, was really, I mean, impressive that they got to as many places as they did. But folks that are really engaged and really uh, know the state now and are really happy to talk to folks uh, when they when they show up at events. So Lizette, does that, does that, do you have anything you want to add yeah. to that? Or? No, I think it's going really um, well. We, um, again. We've been can I just interrupt for one second? I have to leave the meeting, but I do want to say that tourism in the Lake George area, the Adirondacks, the Lake Placid area is definitely up. And I thank you, and I love New York for all their efforts. So thank you very, very much. Okay, and I'll see you at the next meeting. Thanks. Thank you, Thanks, Betty. That's Thanks, exactly where we were this weekend. We were at that article. <laughs> <laughs> That's why it's up. <laughs> there you have it. <laughs> yeah, yeah they, they got record numbers this weekend. They had 50,000 people and 97 balloons launched on Saturday. So it's, it's really it's really a great event. Do you have any con uh, working in collaboration with the Taste New York um, uh, stores that are out there? Because I don't remember. I, I went to a few of them. I don't remember seeing like a, a little, not a booth, but a, any kind of brochures there. As far as, the, so Taste New York, the stores themselves, and this is a great idea, actually. I'm surprised we haven't thought about it. We have talked about it. We've talked about it. <laughs> um, on, the, on the highways, on the roads, uh, and the, the rest areas, the rest plazas, we do have a uh, combination of, of collateral and um, items being offered for sale. The in dedicated stores like Grand Central and to Todd Hill, uh, we probably don't. And that's uh, that's actually a really good well, idea. The Brown Gateway, we do. And I can talk more about Also, that. the airport is no one at um, Kennedy, right? Yeah. 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 yeah, good idea. Yeah, the, the idea with the taste stores that are bricks and mortar is it's more about the product, but it doesn't mean that it should exclude. You just have a, a, a stand with some brochures. Great idea. Great idea. Is that on the uh, New York pod, does it have a hashtag handle or can it have its own sort of personality where it tweets where it is? And it doesn't have its own hashtag, but we encourage people to, to oh, I'm looking yeah. at our digital <laughs> social team over there, we encourage them to. <laughs> to use the I Love New York hashtag when they're there. And okay. through some of our activations, so the green screen that, that um, Gavin was mentioning, there's a, we take your photo and we email it to you. We encourage you on that same screen to post it with the, with the I Love New York hashtag. I think I'll let um, Anna or Christina speak up here, but I think that the idea was we didn't want to have too many hashtags. I want people sort of following. Yeah, we want to we make sure that people are really you know, following the main account because uh, that's where they're going to get the wealth of tourism. Overall, around. Didn't we also uh, tweet out when the pod is following various locations. We've sent out photos before from you know, various different locations, including Adirondack, Great. It's interesting, though. It is, I, I like the idea of pods sort of saying where it is. That, that's, we should we're we're also talking about a promotion, like, you know, some sort of like 
where's the pot today? Right, right. Exactly. I think that's yeah, yeah, that's where right. Where in the world? Exactly. Yeah, where in the world? <laughs> okay. And uh, just a couple other quick things to update you on. You can see there's the Thermonator up there, uh, number two. <laughs> at the, at the, and, and number one was the governor. So, so that's uh, Thurman. But he was at the Adirondack Challenge. Uh, I believe that Thurman's boat finished something like seven seconds behind the governor. Um, so it was highly competitive. But um, we also had our, our bass fishing challenge this year. Uh, the, the lieutenant governor attended. Um, I, I ended up going out on one of the boats uh, for, for a hot minute. And I can tell you, these, these folks are talented. And it's pretty scary, honestly. They, the, the speed they go, you, you have to trust in them. But uh, being up with the New York Power Authority was absolutely beautiful. And you know to have an event come to the North Country like this, Bass has committed to, to next year as well, and we're going to have a pro fishing tournament in New York State as well as the pro am uh, in, in New York State uh, next year. So another thing where we try to carry forward these event activations and make it meaningful for other folks as well. New York State Fair, the great New York State Fair. I, I haven't heard the attendance figures, but um, it was a great run of days. Uh, Jamin, I really give her a ton of credit for uh, the experience at the New York State Fair. Uh, the Lieutenant Governor's there opening up the, the fair, but we have a beautiful building that we're part of now that's part of the parks. It's a parks uh, building that they've uh, partnered with us where folks can come in. It's air conditioned, there's restrooms, and so on and so forth. And um, this year uh, was the first year that we had a Pride Day uh, at, at New York State Fair. To our knowledge, Ross, right, that's the only Pride Day, Pride Day at, New York, at, at, a, at a state fair in the country, correct? Right. And thank you. So, <laughs> any. <laughs> Any questions, any thoughts, uh, random or otherwise, are welcome here. With that, I submit my report. Thank you, Chris. Oh, the commercial, right. We'll, we'll just show you the commercial. If you haven't seen it, we're continuing the celebrity campaign uh, through the fall, and here's one of the commercials that we just dropped. New York is my home. There's no place like it in the world, and there's no time to see it like the fall. Take Metro North to take in the beautiful fall foliage from high above the Hudson. Swing the club at one of America's greatest courses. See spectacular sights underground or thrilling sights above it. There's so many incredible ways to experience the fun of fall in New York State. Plan your trip at iloveny.com. There's something for everyone. That was Michael Douglas, by the way. He got cut off. You shouldn't recognize the voice. Yeah, that was Michael Douglas. Well, thank you, Gavin. Thank you for your report. Um, we wish you the best on continuing all of the wonderful things that you're doing. Uh, and one of those things is bringing a, a better relationship with Taste New York. So it's a, a privilege to interview. Uh, to listen to me. Um, Kevin, you're going to speak about what and how we can do a better job on integrating our two organizations. We thank you already for what you've done. Christine, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And it's, there is truly a very strong nexus between what we're trying to accomplish with the Taste New York Initiative and Tourism in the I Love New York program. Um, many of you have actually contributed, helped us out. Uh, uh, Patty, even with our, our Long Island Wine Council folks, thank you to the folks at Delta. That's a wonderful partnership that's been going on. Uh, I, I think Irene stepped out for a moment, but I, I also wanted to recognize the efforts we've done at MSG. and. And Christine has introduced us to the Valley Table folks in Hudson Valley Restaurant Week. We have another program going out with them uh, the week after next. Just wanted to give you a little bit of a flavor for this initiative, what we're doing, <clears throat> a little bit of where those relationships are and the opportunities. Tom, as you highlighted, to build on some of those. Uh, uh, we have looked at doing kiosks in some of the stores with the I Love New York. In fact, the, the Broom Gateway uh, facility is built around an existing travel and tourism uh, site uh, is a gateway site and we've added the food component now to that as a way to introduce people to New York food and beverage products but just let me give you a snapshot um, and then would welcome any questions thoughts ideas um, this uh, governor Cuomo uh, identified this and announced this new initiative in 2013 as part of his state of the state address um, I you know, my own involvement actually didn't start until about June or July of that year. And frankly, we we have really spent a lot of time uh, developing the infrastructure and capabilities uh, to be able to deliver this kind of a program. It's very ambitious. Uh, and, and, you know, every time it comes up, the governor, I think the refrain I keep, you know, hearing back is quicker, better, bigger, bolder. Um, <laughs> we're going to do more. So. 
you know, I, I think we continue to develop and build out a lot of the ideas and the programmatic functions and how we approach these. Uh, the Isle of New York folks know us quite well, and we do a lot there, particularly when it comes down to the events, um, uh, strong interaction between the two teams that are delivering these. Um, but since its inception, we've done 113 events around the state introducing uh, New York food and beverage products uh, to event goers and participants. Um, some of these have been wonderful, high profile. Uh, you know, the Super Bowl, the, the LPGA, uh, you know, one of the first ones was the PGA in Oak Hill uh, that was just uh, a tremendous event for a lot of our beverage producers in particular, but even some of our cheese producers. The, the connections that were made, the buying activities that took place in follow up to that of the products. Uh, was tremendous. And we do try to measure, and the metric we've really focused on for this initiative has been in terms of gross sales. Uh, whether it's an event that we're at, bringing vendors in to showcase their product, we really want to focus on sales activities to generate revenues for the producers. Um, if you've been around me, you've, you've heard me say this many times. We have, we have 36,000 farms in the state of New York. We have 10,000 food processors, over 700 farm-based uh, wineries, uh, uh, breweries, uh, cideries, distilleries in this state. We have a tremendous amount of breadth and, and uh, agricultural related products, food products that are produced in New York State. Um, there, there's a tremendous amount. Of, and what we want to do is introduce those to people, make them available to people, and ultimately encourage sales activity. So we do, you know, uh, this is not our only focus. We certainly, the agritourism piece and promotion is very important to us as well stimulating that kind of activity, but the economic activity is the metric we've used to identify with this program. So in 2014, the events alone generated 475,000 in, in gross sales. It doesn't sound like a lot, guys, but, but realize this is a new initiative, just getting up and going. Uh, it's actually pretty significant given the events that and the involvement. Over 5.9 million people uh, with brand exposure for taste in general. The, more recently, the newer element to this has been the retail presentations and actually taking uh, public facilities, um, high traffic transportation hubs, uh, I think the airports were mentioned earlier, JFK, LaGuardia, uh, but, but also uh, I came in at Grand Central this morning and coming right in, there it was right in front of me coming out of the tube, uh, the taste store in Grand Central, uh, which is doing phenomenally well. Uh, what you're seeing a picture of here right now is the uh, uh, Broom Gateway Center. Uh, which is a travel and tourism center, existing travel and tourism center. We gave a, the facility a facelift. It's on IE7, right on the Pennsylvania border. Uh, people, you know, now this is where you get your speedy sauce or your Brooks barbecue, for those of you that are familiar with the southern tier. Um, and a lot of gift products, but also some food products that uh, uh, were never available that are, are, are really highlighting and showcasing it locally. Um, just, just in starting these, and again, looking at, at the, the gross sales, uh, last year we generated a million dollars. Uh, I think the airports had been around for, for a year at that point, uh, but Todd Hill only came in in June of, of 2014. So yeah, I'm going to tease a little bit at, at these numbers, and I'm going to give you a little bit different picture here as we go forward. Okay, go ahead. Um, so here's Todd Hill. This this really has been our showcase piece. It's it's a wonderful little, it was a rest area, abandoned for 30 years on the Taconic State Parkway. It used to be a gas station uh, that we've repurposed as a marketplace. Um, it, it does have restrooms. For those of you that travel to Taconic, as I do, I'd stop this morning to use them. Um, it, it's very important. It's strategic. It's about halfway of my trip. So. Um, some my staff would suggest I'm, I'm the greatest user of this facility. But... Uh, you know, we have over 100 producers that have taken advantage of this uh, and putting product on the shelf. It's run by Cornell Cooperative Extension. We've created a great little partnership with the local uh, cooperative ext extension there. We've got folks like Millbrook Winery that puts out coupons to come up and visit their Millbrook Winery. Uh, we have a little farmer's market that operates seasonally on site. Um, but it's it's been very strategic in helping to showcase and helping people to see coming out of the city. We have a lot of, a lot of traffic up that on weekends. Uh, the hours of operation are set up to take advantage and capture that and really showcase those uh, products. The 282 in gross sales the first six months, this is peanuts. Mm -hmm. This facility would generate a million dollars this year in, in gross sales. We're, we're projecting another uh, 12 to 15% increase next year. 
It is a self-sustaining facility, and, and beyond just accomplishing the goals of the initiative, we're actually we're actually sustaining and operating this uh, this rest area with the proceeds from this uh, from the sales of these products. So we're accomplishing a lot of public value and a lot of public purposes, and again, a great nexus between the tourism and. Uh, we do have uh, an interactive display in there, and, and I think we've got it tied. If we don't, we're moving to a digital platform that will very much incorporate the I Love New York. Uh, the, the new app is a wonderful, uh, we have a lot of Taste New York presentations uh, on that app, and we continue to build out, that out with our uh, agritourism sites as well. Um, Irene, she's she's still not here? She had to run. Honey. She 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 helped us tremendously, and, and it's not mentioned on here, but... We did a borough night with the with MSG, and and it really kind of brought home with some clarity. She kept saying, "Hey, Kevin, I think there's a square peg round hole thing here, and uh, you know we really got some challenges with how to put it together." But we went through and did did the night, uh, got a lot of good response out of it, and learned a lot from it. You know, one of the challenges we have, frankly, is that you know, we're we're trying to highlight our, our New York food and beverage projects products on a 1.1 million dollar budget. Uh, Coke, Pepsi, uh, the big boys that we're competing about have bought up all the space. Um, but what I am finding is that we have a tremendous amount of opportunity with some of the minor league teams around the, around the, uh, the state. Uh, the Albany Times Union Center, uh, in fact, there was another article on this weekend's paper uh, by the Times, about the Times Union Center and the Taste New York presentation. Uh, have, they've done a wonderful job. It's a terrific presentation there. Uh, but we've rebranded many of the concessions. Uh, they have offered cut cheeses, uh, meats, their sausages. Uh, Mastriani rolls are in there. Um, all local, we facilitated the connection for them to like, some local producers. The craft beverage products, obviously, you can't go wrong with that, right? And we've got an abundance of those. Um, uh, they sell out on a consistent basis. So um, you see the branding at the uh, at the hockey game. We moved in with the Penn Yan League or the New York Penn League this this year, uh, the, and, and just with a tremendous amount of results. I think next year we're looking at becoming the sponsor for the league, at least for the New York teams. Uh, we had four of the New York teams really jump on board. I mean, what's better than going to your hometown baseball game and having your hometown products served there at the, at the concessions? They're a healthier presentation. They're, they're, they, they may be a little bit uh, higher on price points, but not by a whole lot. We're competitive on most of these uh, products and uh, very easy to do. So they've really, they've really jumped on Lobbying the muck dogs to change their name. <laughs> <laughs> Just doesn't seem to catch it. Proudly a muck dog. Right. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> what is a muck dog? Anyway? Right. <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> we, we've also developed a, a vending platform with the uh, New York State Automated Vending Machine Association and the Commission for the Blind. Um, the Commission for the Blind, obviously, these are blind vendors that have access to public facilities. You see one of the machines there. They've done a nice job. We've got a dedicated machine uh, that was out at the state fair. Uh, that highlights. Uh, you'll see a lot of a lot of dairy products in there, a lot of the milks and yogurts. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, as well as uh, uh, some of the granola bars. Lola granola is a big one, uh, uh, but uh, the, the vending platform has been very useful for us as well. Uh, retail liquor stores, obviously, with with our, the efforts around the beverage summits, we've we've continued to follow that through with branding. Uh, Taste New York and have a very strong partnership with the New York State Liquor Store Association. They have actually, uh, we've, we've decked out six of their stores uh, with Taste to showcase uh, how they would do it and have helped their members to develop really unique local New York presentations to identify the wines, beers, and spirits uh, that are produced locally. There's a big trade show each year that uh, uh, we brought in. Last year was over 90 participants, New York uh, producers, into the trade show for uh, out in Rochester. Roadside signage, I think you've all seen this, and certainly uh, uh, not a lot of explanation. You continue to see more signage going up around the state, and we continue to look and brand uh, appropriate uh, producers. So major expansion for 2015. This was last year's announcement in October, and, and uh, you know, really we went through some soul-searching as to our focus, and like I said, we kind of came back to this metric of sales and, and focusing on that, and we committed to tripling gross sales. Um, you know, I, I will say that we have we have generated at this point this year. Um, uh, you know, I guess I'm not. We will be making an announcement quite soon that we've reached that four and a half million dollar target, which was a tripling 
quite a bit earlier, and the growth in the program continues at a very significant rate and a significant pace. Um, you know, as you can only imagine, as we get these store platforms developed, we get them more operationalized. Um, you're looking at the Grand Central store right there. That's run by one woman wineries. This is a, a farm-based winery. We put it out in our RFP uh, specific for that license type because they, they have some unique abilities to showcase the full range of food and beverage products from around the state. We have a number of RFPs we're working with other state agencies right now to do similar. And then we do the, the, the kind of the extension nonprofit presentations and some of the, the road sides. As we build this out, we're going to really generate significant revenues for our producers uh, uh, as well as help support some of these uh, facilities at the same time. That, that's really all I had. Just wanted to kind of give you a little introduction to what we're doing. Tom? Do, you, uh, do you go around to food uh, farmers markets as well and have a tent with local uh, produce there too? We, we have, so among the programs uh, in our department, we have over 500 farmers markets around the state and, and our department administers the the farmers market program, the SNAP EPT benefits, and the, the uh, Fresh Connect checks program. Um, we've rebranded some of those. Uh, we've the, the Taste New York. Um, uh, the farmers markets pretty much stand on their own. You know, it is. Uh, but we well, like the Union Square, the one in Union Square. There, there are a lot of Pennsylvania farmers there, a lot of right. other farmers there, and, and you know, there should be a Taste New York. I think at least some of the big ones like that. And maybe have an I Love New York, you know, stand as well there. Um, I, I don't know. Is that something that is being thought about, or I, I think the green markets have. You will see some of the out-of-state vendors because the green markets draw a line around 150, 75 miles. So they're looking to keep it within the localized area. We do work with them closely. You will be seeing your Christmas trees for, for the first time at the green markets this year. Um, we continue to, to develop and put more New York products in the into the green markets. Uh, but we've got, if you travel down the thruway, you will see farmers markets that are branded Taste New York at each of the thruway rest areas now. Uh, for the rest of the season, uh, you see the little blue uh, uh, pop-up tents with Taste New York on them. They're all, those are all New York and all local. I mean, the Union Square one might be a good one. We just see a lot of visitors there. It's central to bring the Manhattanites up to up there. And you also, again, have a stand with an I Love New York right there. Right. It's, it's sort of matches together. Absolutely. Kevin, I, I've seen the uh, retail at the, the rest stops on the thruway, which is great. Uh, and I haven't stopped there for a while, but there's a big state facility above uh, on the north way, above exit 29. So the last time I was there was really underused. I just wondered, Gavin, whether that is something that uh, you're planning or you've already done. Is that the high peaks, north and south? Yeah, it's where the state police office is on one side. On the other side, there's a huge uh, building with basically, uh, you know, rest facilities and, and brochures. Beacon, Beacon's out, right, John? Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. right. this summer, there was just the redo of the high peaks rest areas on the north way yeah. um, that were updated with new I Love New York, Path Through History, Taste New York. Yeah. Information Maybe you've done this and displays. Okay. I'm not sure if it's the one you're talking about. I think these are a little. It's sort of the no, gateway we, we, from Canada, Canada too. Yeah, on that's... the drawing board, though, we we have not done anything yet, and we there's okay. conversations around Beacon Town, um, but but and, and this is as a relatively new initiative, folks. There is a tremendous amount of opportunity here, and, and certainly love to hear any thoughts you guys have on specific locations, but. We, we have an abundance of projects in the pipeline right now that we're developing now. Well, we do, but still interested in hearing other projects, too. I, I just Some people will probably say, why, why not there, why over here? And it gets down to availability. It gets down to uh, sometimes the rules, whether they're federal highway rules, which we've confronted a, a bit of recently. Um, uh, you know, there's, there's a fair amount of rules and regulations in trying to develop these public facilities in, uh, that we have, uh, but that's what our focus is right now. Uh, and, and I just want to highlight the connection between uh, I Love New York and Taste New York in terms of, you know, the, the mission, of course, of Taste New York, as Kevin talked about, is about selling New York products. Um, but it's also the, the sort of unique thing about Taste New York as opposed to other initiatives that have had that same goal is it's also about food and beverage-based experiences. So that's about agritourism for sure, but it's also about those iconic 
New York restaurants, the only in New York restaurants, whether it's Dinosaur Barbecue or Nathan's Hot Dogs in Coney Island. And so when I Love New York talks about food and beverage, which is a really important sort of platform for us, we connect that to Taste New York. Very often when Taste New York talks about uh, food and beverage, they look for opportunities to also talk about, well, you enjoy this product, you should go visit you know, and go pick your own apples up there as well. So you see that through the signage, you see that through uh, our websites, you see that through the apps, um, trying to make that connection that this is, yes, about products and also about experiences. Yeah, yeah I remember back uh, a couple of years ago when the governor announced this, uh, if you asked how many Taste New York attractions there were, the answer was zero. There was no such thing as a Taste New York attraction. So Kevin and his team had to identify and threshold you know, folks into the program, much like we did with Path or History, where you had to qualify with some sort of a touristic experience, and not just—it's not just about a product. There has to be, you know, an example like Home Again, right, where you, where you have a great experience, and are actually building out that experience, or Beacon Skiff in the Finger Lakes, where it's—it's it's got product, but at the same time, it has lots of touristic experiences. Yeah. No, I, I look at it very much. You know, we've we've gone through uh, over the last uh, years of. Development of this program, a lot of people have been still searching. We're going to go through over the next two months. Uh, another, you know, now that we've been two months, two years in this, what's the next step? How we, we have a lot of a lot of retail projects in the pipeline. We're looking to develop these public facilities. I think that's what we're going to continue to stay focused on. And on, on, like I said, there's parks and recreational facilities. There's there's still more DOT roadside facilities to be developed. Uh, a tremendous amount of opportunities, some OGS properties that we're looking at currently. Uh, some here, uh, uh, some local authorities here down in the city that we're working with as well. So, uh, but but still interested in hearing the we 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 strong relationship with the I Love New York folks and a strong nexus there with travel. Todd Hill is, is great. I mean, I was just abandoned. It was waste. It was unsightly. But, you know, that's that's a great. You know, it's a it's a wonderful. Now our problems with Todd Hill are we. It, it, it has so much traffic, people can't get into the bathrooms. We, we're having a hard time selling products. <laughs> There's so many people in that little store. So we're trying to manage those those situations. Wonderful problems to have. Yeah. More bathrooms. Uh, <laughs> More products, but I've been on that line. We're talking about the line. <laughs> <laughs> you have to know it's I can see I'm not the only one stopping there. <laughs> but, uh, thanks, Kevin, for all your great work. And also, uh, you mentioned it, but I do want to give you some congratulations on getting the Christmas tree sales down here in, in in New York City. I know that wasn't just as easy as it may seem. Uh, and just a reminder that Winter's Eve is the Monday after Thanksgiving. It's going to come up really fast. It's the big Christmas celebr oops, holiday celebration. Make sure we take that out of the record. Um, but, um, and for the first time ever, they had a New York State holiday tree, Christmas tree. Uh, they're yeah, looking for another one, by the way. It has to be 25 feet, and you know they're willing to. We could do that. But they got a lot of press for the Christmas tree industry um, by having that publicly displayed on the Upper West Side. So thank you. Uh, we added a an agenda item for a new business for TAC members. So if you have anything new that you want to share with us or anything hospitality related, now's your chance. Nothing new. Where do we stand on all the different subcommittees? Uh, they're starting to meet. We went over that in the beginning of the meeting, okay. so you're going to be getting a notice on the next meeting okay. for the hospitality. Okay. I know Betty Little wanted to update us, but she did before she, uh, she went off. Okay. So if there is no, is there any new business that anybody would like to introduce? One quick note. Stay tuned. We are looking to have a tourism summit later this year. Just working on it on an actual date that we can focus on, but uh, likely sometime in November, and we'll give you an, as much notice as we possibly can, but uh, looking forward to doing that with the governor later this year. Great, Gavin, and that reminds me, we have changed the meeting date of the next TAC meeting from November 16th, which is a Monday, to November 18th, and we've changed it from New York here to Albany, so um, in hopes that that could be one of the days of the Tourism Summit. It's looking likely so we'll keep you posted as soon as we have more clarity and we would make that meeting most likely around 11 o'clock to coordinate with the Amtrak schedule right at least well, well we also have to coordinate it with the schedule of the summit itself so right, exactly sometimes yeah. that has been first thing in the morning sometimes that's been in the afternoon during breakout sessions 
we'll we'll see as it all comes together and we'll let you know but yes we're trying to also be obviously conscious of the transit schedule as well right and tom to your point we'll have the subcommittee meetings between now and then so okay. that you'll be able to do an update an update at that meeting okay okay um and silver any anything you want to add just a lot of events a lot of press trips and uh, still pushing for the fall and winter Great. Well, thank you for your fine work. And without further ado, I will ask for a motion to close the meeting. So moved. Okay, John Ernst. Second. And Ellen Ortega. <laughs> Second. Uh, thank you very much for your time to TAC, and we look forward to seeing you in November and hearing from you before then. Thank you.